when you look back on it, obviously, it's, uh, it is quite thrilling. Come on, come on, lads, he says, fight. I still get emotional, actually, just talking about that. Amazing, isn't it? After all these years. <laughs> we were a side that deserved to be champions of England. It was just a bonus to add the FA Cup and to go into the history books. It's a great achievement, really, when you think. Not many clubs had done it, had they? I've got grandchildren now, and I get them to read the history books of Arsenal. I just think it was a fantastic achievement. Things like that never sink in for a couple of days. It's a few days before it really settles in and you think, that was wonderful. To be able to play for a club like the Arsenal and do the things we did there, I was, I was very lucky. It's nice to play a small part in the club's great history. We weren't probably the prettiest team, the team that plays the, the most beautiful football, but for effort, enthusiasm, organisation, team spirit, whatever word you want to call it, I think we had it in abundance. Oh, Charlie George, you can hit him! Oh, a great goal! Charlie George! Oh, what a fabulous goal by George! There's a lot of history at this football club. Before you join and you should know about it, and uh, for us to do that and make history w w was quite amazing. And Arsenal have won, and they've done the double. It's the summer of 1970, and manager Bertie Mee is plotting one of the greatest seasons in the proud history of Arsenal. It was a squad that was starting to realise its potential. They'd recently lifted the European Fairs Cup after 17 years without a trophy and were once again a team on the rise. We knew ourselves we were improving all the time. I mean, there was, there was Pat Rice come through, there was Peter Simpson come through, Peter Storey come through, John Radford, Ray Kenny, who was bought at 18, Jordi Armstrong come through. Uh, Eddie Kelly, John Samuels. So there was about seven players come through the reserves, a year with us, and then this, I think, was the second year, and we were just bonding together. Lovely talk to Kelly. Made a little space for himself there, Kelly. And a bit more there as well. to get it back. George Grail to Bob McNabb right up and he turn it back. A good cross there from McNabb. <laughs> so now Arsenal must in this last 17 minutes make absolutely sure they concede nothing. If it stays 2-0 to the end, the Bears Cup comes to Highbury. When we won the European Fairs Cup, that was the first trophy that Arsenal won in 17 years. Oh, that was a tremendous goal by Samuels! I think it gave us a lot of belief in that we perhaps could do a lot better in the league and then in the FA Cup than we did the previous year. So, um, yes, I think winning the European Fairs Cup gave us hope and gave us belief that we could take it on from there. That was really the, the occasion when we actually started to, to believe, you know, we're on the right way. Uh, I think under Bertie Mee, was, uh, the team was much more organised. They brought in Don Howe. We became a much better organised team. Everybody knew their jobs. We were progressing. Um, you know, we hadn't won a trophy for about 17, 18 years. We won the first cup, the old first cup. And then we were progressing slowly. Uh, the team were coming together. Bradford! We knew we were side coming on, you know, was uh, we just won the first cup and everything, so um, we knew we were going to be there or thereabouts anyway. To win the double would have been way above our expectation to start that season. Winning the double when we won it was quite unbelievable because it had only been done twice in 71 years. 
People used to say, oh, you'll never win, you'll never win the double. Um, it's, oh, it's, there's too many games. Things have moved on in the modern game. You expect far more doubles, and indeed, you know, the, the Arsene Wenger sides have achieved two extra doubles, so Arsenal Football Club has now managed to, to notch up three. It's so difficult to win, so I don't know if the modern day people understand what an achievement it was. It was a fantastic team effort it was for a squad of players, not just the 11. The 16 players that were involved in it were fantastic and very important. Right from the off, Arsenal would have to take the difficult route to the double. Ravaged by pre-season injuries, there were more broken bones on the opening day. I started playing up front with Charlie and that was really, really a good partnership. And going into the double year, uh, I think the first game was away to Everton and Charlie broke his ankle that day. I think we drew 2-2. Two, two. I have a double fracture on my right ankle. The Gordon West, the uh, oversized Everton goalkeeper, actually uh, come out and clattered me. Yeah, it wasn't a good start to the season because I was really flying, but uh, you know, it helped the team really. Big Ray come into the side and played alongside John and they formed a formidable partnership. I'd never played with Ray, he was only a kid. And uh, it just happened with Ray. Although we did work, you know, every afternoon on things, but we were very much alike. The only difference, Ray was all left foot and I was all right side, so it worked very well. I broke my ankle in a pre-season game in Denmark and I missed quite a lot of the early games, along with uh, Charlie George and, and Peter Simpson. Young Pat came in, as he was then, and played in, at right back. The management team had the foresight to change Peter Story, who had been a regular full-back, and put him in a midfield anchor role. I mean, I've always said that Peter was a better right back than he was in midfield, but we needed that little bit of dig in, in the middle of midfield, and Peter gave us that. You needed a strong physical player there to combat other players, um, and Peter did that job down the routine. He gave the, he gave the team balance and solidity, and um, yeah, it, it, we, we, you know, you can't underestimate how important that was, Peter's story going into that midfield position. It's strange how the, 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 the early injuries in, in lots of ways, um, created the double. Arsenal back at Highbury for the first time since winning the European Fairs Cup. The cup in the hands of skipper Frank McClintock, Bob Wilson there to his left, and good to see at long last, I must say, Frank McClintock being able to get his hands on a trophy after such wretched luck at Wembley in his career with Leicester and with Arsenal. The supporters rising to the team, they must feel too that the start that Arsenal have made away from home, picking up two points, all goes well for a further improvement of the Arsenal in the 70s. They must feel that the first cup is just the start of something new at Highbury. They've had some wretched luck with injuries, and they've got to do without uh, Charlie George, Peter Simpson and John Samuel for quite a time. On by Kenny. John Radford. Story has moved to the inside right position. Armstrong in the middle. Radford on his own. Graham diagonally forward. Not pushed anything like hard enough. Mass United have got a man over for a change. Best. He was onside, Wilson out, beautifully taken. Never took his eye off the ball for a second. Graham, Rice, Graham. Story. Kennedy going in. His third goal after 15 minutes of the second half. And what a start to Arsenal's home season. Bradford. Then he got Kennedy up with him. Armstrong behind him. Graham going in. Bob Wilson, I just had a glance at. Very happy, as is George Graham.
hear of his comments now on tonight's coverage and also the match in which he played. Uh, Bob Wilson, the Arsenal goalkeeper, and well satisfied once more this week, Bob, yeah. with the Arsenal performance. Marvellous week for us, really, David, and uh, today it's been a great performance for us. We're the side that uh, obviously we're having a bit of trouble with injuries, but the lads who are in are doing a fantastic job, they really are. But I, I must say I was particularly chuffed today with uh, one when uh, it was George Best and I, he was through on his own, tight control, and I just managed to get it away from his feet. And I bet you've had a lot of, of John Radford in the dressing room after that hat-trick today, Oh, yes, you? yes. John was very, very pleased. Another hat-trick for him. Uh, he's, he's had one every year now for the last, uh, I think, the last five seasons he's had a hat-trick, and he's very pleased with it. Radford was so underrated, I thought. I mean, John Radford today would be one of the best strikers in the country, very similar to Shearer, you know, very similar in the physique and everything about his game. John Radford was, was John Radford. Not, uh, he was one of the lads that I oh, was sort of brought up with it through the, through the youth team. Very unselfish player. Although he's a big man, uh, John, he was, he was very nimble, um, but just so unselfish. You know, he, he would make one run if he, if, he, if, he, if he didn't get the ball. He wouldn't say, oh, he'd make another one, and then make another one. Very unselfish. I was a centre forward. You go out there trying to get a goal every game. Um, I think myself, I wasn't a prolific goal scorer anyway. You know, when you look back through uh, through the career, but uh, I think everyone appreciated who, who, who actually played alongside you. A win, a defeat, and a draw followed. The hard-earned point against Leeds United at Highbury would prove crucial at the end of the campaign. A goalless draw secured by ten men after Eddie Kelly's red card. Clintock. Radford who run clear. Hancock off his line and never looking at getting it. Look at him. That's a good ball from Graham. He's got three on the far post, one coming across the nearest Kennedy. George Armstrong on the wing. George was a special player for us because he could play either side, cross the ball with both feet, and his work rate was absolutely brilliant. I mean, um, I think he epitomised the Arsenal team at that time. George, how long have you been at Arsenal? Well, this is my 10th season now, Jimmy. And how do you feel the club has progressed in that time? I mean, are Arsenal as great now, as, as good as they've ever been? Well, in that time, I've certainly seen good individuals, but this team at the present time is the best I've played in. What is there about the team that makes it extra special? Well, just the spirit in the team. Everybody's fighting for one another. And that's about it. You know, they've got faith in each other. And there's a lot of skill in the team, actually, as well. I'm glad you mentioned that, because some Arsenal fans feel that the, you know, there still isn't enough skill in the middle of the field. Do you think there is skill there? Well, I suppose every team's got room for improvement, but at the moment, I can't see anybody getting our team at the moment, you know. Geordie was, well, he was unbelievable, little Geordie. Fantastic little player. God knows what he'd be worth today. I mean, uh, he's just up and down. I think he wore the pitch out on that side, didn't he? With two points for a win, the first seven games had returned nine points. Success was being built on a team spirit that had been nurtured over years. There was about six of the team who had come up through the youth teams and we knew each other well. And then you had your comics like I mean, George Graham had always had a quip and Frank McClintock was always sharp-witted. You had Sammy Nelson who was full of jokes. So, yeah, it was... Um, it was a happy, happy dressing room. I think we were a good unit. You know, I mean, we all blended in together. Don believed in a certain uh, work ethic uh, from a team rather than individuals. We weren't probably the prettiest team or the, the team that plays the, the most beautiful football, but for effort, enthusiasm, organisation, team spirit, whatever word you want to call it, I think we had it in abundance, and uh, that came from mainly Bertie and Don. All the work, you know, that they made us do Monday to Friday, it, it produced the results on the Saturday. Bertie Mee was brilliant at picking good men around him because Bertie would tell you himself, tactically and coaching-wise, he wasn't really up for it. He was a physiotherapist most of his life, an excellent physiotherapist. But we found out he was a great disciplinarian and a great organiser. As a player, I don't think he was that popular with many players. Uh, I think the, the majority of players respected him, but I don't think they had a great love for Bertie. That was my opinion as well, you know, when I was a player. But since I've become a manager, 
then I really re realised the positive things he had about him, the things that he was good at. He was like a little general, you know, he was almost like a little Napoleon. And he could be quite sharp with you, and certainly I remember Frank having rare old set twos with Bertie. Um, so there was his a part of it. Then he had his right hand man, who was Don Howe, who was truly inspirational. I mean, we loved Don. I mean, he was very tactile. So he was absolutely in your face. I can remember wiping away a bit of spit here and there if he was in your face saying, Willow, you didn't do this. And I would be fighting back. And, and then if you played, if you played well, if you performed, he would be arms around you, hugging you, incredibly tactile. So there was Bertie Mead, there was Don Howe. But Don was great belief, you know, and as I say, you know, that's down to Don and Bertie. But this belief in, you know, that never give in. And, the only thing they, they say, always do your best, work hard at it, you know what I mean? You've set standards, and that was a great, the great word at Arsenal, was always standards, you know, and that was Bertie to a T, you know, don't drop your standards, boys. Whenever we travelled, it was with blazing flannels, and it was always smart, and it was really from the old school days, you know, and uh, we actually would never give in. Arsenal's defence of the European Fairs Cup began with two-legged success against Lazio. But domestically, they're about to experience their biggest defeat of the season, away at Stoke. Well by George Graham. Eddie Kelly. Kennedy. Armstrong. This is picked up by Burrows. Greenoff in almost the right position. Roberts having to clear very quickly indeed. This is Dobing. Good ball, Greenoff, to Conroy, looking for Richie again, Richie there, and it's a goal! That was a very well taken goal indeed, Big John Richie scores his sixth goal of the season and puts Stoke City one goal ahead. Greenoff with a flick, but came to McNair, and Richie. One man and another. Now Richie in with a chance. Richie with a shot. And what a great goal by John Richie! What an absolutely great goal. The Arsenal defence was staggered by the fact he fought for that ball. Greenoff, Kadobing, Conroy, Marsh cutting down that right wing. Good one-two, and a good shot, and what a goal! What a goal! What a great one-two that was, and Terry Conroy put that ball past Bob Wilson, he didn't even see it. This is Barrows. Too close. Armstrong, it's a good cross, and Farmer took it well. This is Conroy again. Marsh is absolutely steaming down that right wing. That's a good ball, come to Greenhoff. And the bounce of the ball is there, Greenhoff with a chance. It's a chip, and it's in the net! A great goal by Greenhoff! How beautifully he plays that, he's just waited for it. Arsenal's defence again in tatters. And a shot blocked, again by Smith. This is Harry Burrows, only three men up at the moment. But Marsh going down that right wing, and there he goes. Marsh is cutting in very fast, Richie with him. Marsh with a shot. With one save, there's another goal! Alan Bloor makes it 5-0 for Stoke City. I think had we been a little bit of a younger side and not gone close to winning things and then winning the first European trophy for the club, I think it could have been a devastating sort of blow. I mean, everything went in on the day, everything went wrong for us, every shot they took seemed to go in. We were miserly you know, giving goals away, you know. It was hard to score against Arsenal in those days. For anybody to beat us five, it just was unheard of. But yeah, we bounced back, you know, no problem. They dropped me, <laughs> which, was probably, which was probably the right thing to do. But I always remember that, you know, we, we lost five, but, uh, but the team bounced back again and we went on a great run again. We went, I think, 13, 14 games unbeaten immediately after that. And that taught us, that really told everybody that we were a side that deserved to be champions of England. It was just could we beat 
this amazing side of Don Reeves that could play beautiful football but had a, a, a sort of cynicism about them. Uh, and that added to our sort of desire to, to try and pip them, which we did. A 4-0 win against Nottingham Forest included a Ray Kennedy hat-trick. It left Arsenal three points behind Leeds at the beginning of October. And John Roberts, the big Arsenal defenders, crept up to the edge of the 18-yard line. Armstrong, Graham, Kennedy! Rice. Kennedy! Radford with the throw. And he can throw a long one too. Kelly! They don't come much better. He took it supremely well. Don Howe, this talented Arsenal coach, must be so well pleased. Story. And was it hands? Yes! Kenyon, the offender, totally unnecessary, but clear cut. As a team, we were becoming this perfect, what I call the perfect jigsaw. But it, this was a jigsaw which, which you know, it had, it had smooth edges. It had the smoothness of George Graham. It had the absolute artistry of Charlie George. But it had some incredible street fighters within there. John Radford, Eddie Kelly when he had to play in the game, Peter Storey. Bob McNabb was an incredible talker. You couldn't stop him talker. Frank is an incredible leader. We were all coming together. Even I was coming together as the, as the late developer and believing that I could, you know, on my day, perform as well as the best goalkeepers in the country. Bob, funnily enough, in the footballing circles was probably underrated, but not at Arsenal. Bob was really, he made himself a goalkeeper. His work ethic, you know, Monday to Friday in training was fantastic. And he made him a better goalkeeper himself. But he loved coaching, he loved being coached. Uh, he worked hard at it. Any improvement it was really down to Bob. He had a great feeling for wanting to get better and better. Well, it seems that the shouting match on the terrace has got a little more warmth and passion to it than the match on the pitch itself. But here's Radford. A break by Armstrong and McFarlane getting there first and Kelly going in! Kelly! Oh, big piece of opportunism by Eddie Kelly! Arsenal slow. George Graham. That's aimed towards Radford. Up he goes! Oh, Radford! My goodness, what a leap! Arsenal's small but perfectly formed squad returned four wins from five league games in October and were now within striking distance of Leeds at the top of the table. They were mining a rich seam of form in the autumn months. We only played 15, 16 players all through the season. But in those days, it was a, it was a theory that you played, you know, a, a winning team stays together. And to be honest, as players, you didn't want to be out of the team. It's very frustrating when you... Uh, especially when you've been a regular player to sit and watch the team. It's a funny situation because you want the team to do well, but you know if, they're gonna, if they keep doing well, you're not going to get back in the team. So even as subs, you can never really feel 100% part. Although the club involves you and all that, you like to put your shift in and, and you're not doing it when you're sitting on the bench. Now the action from Highbury yesterday. Arsenal against Liverpool, a vital first division match because both are pacemakers on the table, both desperate now for victory to keep in touch with Leeds at the very top. And today, undoubtedly, it'll be a stern challenge for Arsenal, but at least they have John Samuels back in their side, his first home appearance after a bad ankle injury, skillful attacker, powerful shot, and at the other end of the Arsenal side, a return to Highbury for the number six, Peter Simpson. This after a cartilage operation, now he takes his familiar place in the back four. Well, as you would expect, it's a match that's attracted a big crowd to Highbury. There are now over 45,000 in the ground. And the referee today is John Yates from Worcestershire. Ross. Oh, and now Graham. Quick ball for Samuels. Graham! Oh, a fine goal! George Graham! And what a goal it was! That was unstoppable! Good run there by 
by Graham, and he's picked on for Kennedy. Oh, and surely he will score. Radford! Arthur Kennedy made such a meal of it, with Liverpool claiming offside, so 2-0. Yesterday, you didn't get the goal early on against his mm -hmm. defence, but of course, when you did get it, Bill Shankly said it was offside. Mm -hmm. uh, we can now look and see exactly how it came about. Well, the Arsenal forwards here do a lot of challenging here, putting the defence under pressure. I think that's John Samuels, just wins the ball there to George Graham. George draws the man in, plays it to John Samuels, and a beautiful chip over his head. And you can see George is well onside, and he connects with a beautiful volley. And there's no chance of that ball being offside there, Jimmy, I don't think. No chance at all. It's indicative, really, of the Arsenal method, the, the way in which you put defences under pressure to, to win the ball. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't think sometimes the sports really understand this because they look upon you as a hard grinding side, uh -huh. but you have to win it before you can play that kind of football. Of course you do, and it's very difficult to keep this sort of um, tackles in. You know, if you're diving from one player to another, you have to get it done collectively by your forwards or else you'll just get shattered after 20 minutes. And you can see just from that goal there, there was about three players involved there. There was Peter Storey, John Samuels and George Graham, and eventually we won the ball, a good one too, and it finished up with a goal. We're very knowledgeable as a team in tactics. We, we weren't all over the place. We're well drilled with Don Howe, Bertie Mee, especially Don Howe. And we had some really terrific professionals in it at the time. And I thought, once we go one nothing up, you can forget about it. You can go for a cup of tea, go home if you like, come back half an hour later, it'll still be one nothing. We were always a difficult team to play against and a difficult team to beat. And we were always capable of, of, of not playing so well and winning. Armstrong, Graham. Wilson now to Munro. Oof! In the way of uh, Samuels, that story. Oh, oh, Samuels and that flick from Kennedy nearly played off Bradford. Two now. We didn't know that we were going to win the league or win the cup or do the double. You don't know that. We were doing well. We got on with it, you know, like, well, let's keep the results going. Uh, that, that was when we got into the dressing room. Come on, last week's gone. Let's do it this week. Uh, don't let's think too far ahead. And, and, it, and it worked out. That's why in the end we did the double, because they had this resolve. They got round each other. They wanted to win. They made their mind up. They wanted to win something. And nobody wanted to win something more than Frank McClintock. The captain would become the footballer of the year and the driving force behind the double. I always associate Frank with a general in the army, you know. He was the one who used to lead us all into battle. And we were all behind him 100%. He gave everybody this great, um, great feeling of togetherness. Uh, never give in and he expected everybody underneath him not to give an either. For me, he was the greatest captain I ever played with uh, and played under, and Frank McClintock just was. He was out of the gorbals, he was a fighter. He'd, uh, he'd had quite a tough life to where he'd got to. He'd, he'd been in four losing Wembley finals previous to the double year. So by then, he knew everything there was to, to get to finals, but never to pick up the winner's medal and he just was a very, very inspirational leader. I was a natural captain. I don't think I ever planned anything out. I just was so enthusiastic. I'd, I had an awful lot of drive and probably still have a lot of that in me. I'm just that type of person. So I would just act normally, grab people by the throat at half time. And Frank and I were big mates, but even a couple of times, you know, he swung a punch at me you know, coming up the tunnel at half, night, half time for not, uh, not working hard enough. I respected him for that and uh, a great captain, a great captain, one of the best Arsenal's ever had. I never planned anything, it was spontaneous. You know, I'd react quickly to things, whether it's giving somebody a rollicking or whether I'm patting them on the back or trying to pick them up from some bad thing that happened to them, you know. I, I wasn't really aware of being a captain, I just was the captain, you know. Redford moving in as the ball is kicked. Dab, Redford, Graham, and a goal scored by McClintock. 
Fitzpatrick, the little fellow, on the goal line. Oh, and have a lovely header by Graham. 2-0. Two, two corners, two goals. Rice Kennedy. And it's 3-0. Five straight league wins for Arsenal in the run-up to Christmas. But Leeds continued to set the pace in what looked like a two-horse race. The Gunners had an unlikely backer. I think Arsenal will uh, will probably win the title this year, the way they're playing. I know it's uh, it may be the wrong thing to say back home, folks, about <laughs> but uh, they look very good to me, Arsenal, this year, actually. They played very well against Tottenham and they look uh, a very good bet, I think, to, uh, to challenge Leeds for the title. Dreams of a white Christmas came true in the capital. But the crowds who made it to Highbury for the Boxing Day bout with Southampton found the visitors determined to play Scrooge. A goalless draw brought Arsenal's first drop point since the middle of November. Now the ball through with Story. Radford on the turn. Oh, he did well there, and so did Martin. That really was a shot out of the blue, and Martin almost cold, I would think. Grabbed it very well indeed. McNabb, Armstrong to Graham. Kennedy coming for this one. Radford trying to take one on the turn! All against the post! The first hurdle of the FA Cup campaign was provided by non-league Yeovil and a third-round FA Cup clash that ticked all the boxes for a potential upset. Yeovil's slippery slope wasn't causing too many sleepless nights at Arsenal, though. It's never crossed your mind that you might lose this game, not even in a nightmare? Well, it's, I've thought about it. It would be a terrible thing for Arsenal if we did get beat, and it's, it is a possibility. I won't say it isn't, but um, I think it's very unlikely. Story. Samuels. Rice moving up outside him. Radford in the middle. In goes Radford! Two men up for Arsenal, Armstrong making it three. This is Kennedy, now Samuel's coming forward. Story going outside Armstrong. Got a touch, and it's Kennedy who finally pushed it in. Kelly. Armstrong round the back, Redford up. In your year at Wembley, at what stage did the Arsenal players feel it was going to be their big year? I mean, which I round? I don't know, I think, um, I think it was after they beat Yeovil. And it was an away pitch, a slope. And we got through that one and there was no looking back. I think they realised then that we could get there. How much does it drain a team to be going for the League and Cup double? I think it's, um, you get paid for it, so uh, it's enjoyable. I don't think it drains you, I think you enjoy it more. I think the strain comes when you're um, lower down in the league. When you're doing well, you, you forget about it, you just enjoy it. I think uh, the strain comes when you're not doing well. Clark, forward to Nicholson. Mahoney moving to the right for Huddersfield. This is the young 18-year-old playing his first senior game. Couldn't have a tougher test, could you? Nicholson. Chapman! He's got it! Beautiful goal! 30 minutes gone. There's quite a few fellows in this Arsenal lineup who can shoot. They're all congregating around that ball. I wouldn't be one of those four Huddersfield players. They're all the tea in China. There's Graham moving up, number 11. And a fine goal! What a beautiful goal by, by Kennedy. This is Clark. Oh, that looks especially like hands. Is it a penalty? I, I think it could well be a penalty. The referee going to have a word with the linesman. Inside or outside. Penalty! Oh, and Arsenal. 
Russell are going to the linesman now. Mr. Richardson of Lincoln, but there was no doubt McClintock handled that ball. So Bob Wilson against, I think, Worthington, number nine. It hit the, a goal. Yes, it hit the station behind the goal. I thought it hit the post. So, Wellington. Halfway through the season, we played Huddersfield when we were drawing uh, one each, and the ball came over and I tried to chest the ball down, if I remember, and I don't actually think it touched my arm at all. But I know for a fact that it was outside the box, probably two, maybe three feet outside the box. Inside or outside? got to accept these and, and we accepted them and it was the next game that was important, not, not the one that we'd, we'd just lost. And it swings and roundabouts, it evens itself out. Arsenal needed a replay to overcome second division Portsmouth in the FA Cup fourth round. The two games sandwiching a 2-0 reverse at Liverpool. Consecutive league defeats leading to some inevitable questions. We haven't played as well as we can and one or two players might have lost a little bit of confidence but... Uh... I don't think there's any team in the country can play 42 good games a season. Mm. And you're going to have indifferent games, you know. Yeah. And um, we've had two or three little bit indifferent where we've played well in the first half and gone off in the second, or played badly in the first half and, and come back in the second. There was good news in the replayed fixture against Pompey, though. Charlie George was back on the field after recovering from his early season fracture, helping Arsenal get back to winning ways. Samuels, Arsenal mounting another attack. Simpson. McNabb's gone down the left wall. Simpson going on. And going on again. A good looking throw! Oh, there it is! By Radford! There it is! John Radford! The Gunners had come through their worst spell of the season and sat just three points behind the leaders. There was everything to play for, as the management team were keen to emphasise. We had a big meeting, Bertie May pulled a big meeting in and really sat us down and told us. You know, he didn't think that we realised that we were on to something special. And I think it went along the lines of, if memory serves you know, um, we're on this, the brink of something big. Um, you could go down in Arsenal's history. Don't waste it. Um, give it everything you've got. George, what now? Booth for Manchester City. Bell. Young. McNabb. Radford. Good ball. George is not offside. He crossed the halfway line. He's on his own. Just the goalkeeper. 2 0. Lovely, uh, typical Manchester evening, wasn't it? Pouring down the rain, thick mud. That's what I loved. I loved playing in them conditions. I didn't like playing in the hot too much. First one was just a straightforward free kick, really. And then the second one, I think I ran from the halfway line and knocked it in. And I laid on the floor, my famous uh, hands up in the air. And um, did that in the final as well. So I always remember them games. Charlie was a cheeky chap here. He was a cocky boy. He used to get sick before games now. He was nervous before games, but he had a great talent, Charlie. He had a wonderful talent. And, um, but we had other good kids coming in, like John Samuels, who played brilliantly for us as well, Eddie Kelly. And that everybody, it wasn't always the same team all the time, you know. So the 16 players were vitally important. John Roberts at the back coming in for Peter Simpson, you know. So everybody played their part. The Gunners were still chasing silverware on three fronts and continued to match Leeds stride for stride at the top of the first division table. At the end of February, though, Don Revy's side were out of the FA Cup free to concentrate on the league and about to lengthen their lead over Arsenal. Hinton with the indirect free kick. And the goal! 31 minutes. McFarland has put Derby in the lead. could well have been decided. The gap at the top was now seven points, but with two games in hand, Arsenal responded in the only way they knew, 
A run of nine consecutive league victories began with a 3-0 win at Molyneux and continued at the Palace. Hoagley. Still Hoagley, a flick now for Kemba. Can he turn it back? He can, and Birchall going in for it, but McClintock getting ahead to it. Manab only as far as Sewell. Kemba again, still Palace piling it on. Just against the bar, and Scott just passed. My goodness, how close. McClintock. Graham at the far side there, getting him his head. Lintock making a burst into that penalty area. Birchinal going with him, looking for him, losing him and finding him again. And Wall to get it away. It's George Graham to Peter Storey. John Sewell, I can't think why he's uh, trying to put it in the corner flag there. It seems as though he wants to waste time. In any case, it's Arsenal in possession again with George Graham. McClintock right up there on this side of the field. And Radford going in with a header. And Samuels too! And there it is! A deflection off McCormick, but the credit must go to Samuels. You think, well, are we better to have the points on the board or, or the games in hand? And I suppose, really, it might be better to have the points, because if you've got games in hand, you've still got to win those games. But I always fancied that we were going to catch them. A European exit at the hands of Cologne left Arsenal with dual targets for the rest of the campaign. The pursuit of Leeds would have to dovetail with a quest for the cup, now at the quarter-final stage. What are going to be taken by Armstrong. Shelton came out, George with a header. Charlie George scores for Arsenal. Arsenal won, Leicester City nil, and only seconds remaining in the first half. Smith across the goal line. And a rebound, a goal! Oh, a rebound goal! That goal was a clearance which rebounded. A fantastic goal! And it looks like Greenock. Well, who do we credit that goal to? Dennis Smith. That was an attempted clearance which appeared to rebound into the net. Burrows flicking it on. Simpson, that was meant for Richie. Oh, what a charge! What a mistake! Richie must make number two. It's there. What a terrible mistake! And John Richie makes it number two, and an absolute gift. They were freaky goals that, that Stoke scored, but we weren't playing particularly well. And it's what happened in the 10 minutes at half time, not 15 minutes that you get now. It was 10 minutes, and Frank in mo almost unbelievable inspirational it wasn't just shouting for the sake of shouting it was it was real leadership we were saying at half time right let's get back to them they had their spell it's now our turn we can still do this we're a better side than them you know and it was a manner in which he did it with his hands and his voice and his you know and 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 almost to you know he he, he dragged you into his into his sort of fighting spirit that he had when you we gave them a chance they didn't take it quite as much as they should have done. We were there for the taking in the first half, but they didn't get a chance again. Armstrong with the throw. Kennedy. Graham and Radford are there. They're scoring. A good job. <laughs> The key to it was that we got a goal early in the second half, but it still looked as if time was running out and you got, you know, the World Cup winning goalie there, Banksy, at the other end. Armstrong waiting across to take this kick. Over it comes, up goes Radford, a header and a penalty! A handle on the line, what a dramatic finish, it must be a penalty! Undoubtedly a penalty in injury time! I think, really, if I had to single that game out for anything, it would be the cold eyes and nerve of Peter Storey when he had to take a penalty at the end of the game. And Peter stood, stood up to it and I thought, oh my God, you know, thank God it's not me. And 
and Arsenal feel now that this may be the last kick of the game and the man with this dreaded responsibility of saving Arsenal from defeat and of robbing Stoke of their Wembley dream is Peter Storey. What a moment of drama. Gordon Banks can't move. Here comes Storey. He's there. Well, what about that penalty and the wonderful coolness of Peter Storey in taking it at that very last minute? Uh, before he'd hardly got his breath back yesterday, I asked him about it. Well, uh, so was it a corner or a free kick? I can't remember, really. I think Frank got up to it, handed it down, and uh, someone punched it away, didn't they? That's right. Should have been my goal. I went up and beat all of them in the air in the last minute and headed it right in the corner. I'm gutted about that. Finished up Peter Storey's goal. Everybody forget that their right back jumped and punched it round the, the post. So I'd have loved to have scored in the semi-final to take us, but it was Peter Storey, ice cool, put it by Gordon Banks. What were you thinking about? I was praying, really, just I thought, it's got to go, we can't miss it now. The most important kick you've probably ever taken in your life, I would think, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, I must think so, yeah. Must be, yeah. Yes, indeed. But you've, you've had some success with penalties this season, of course, haven't you? Yeah, I think it's the fifth or sixth one I've scored. I've missed one in the first cut, but uh, I've had quite a few in the last minute. Three, I think. That's my third one in the last minute, I think. Yeah, don't keep doing that for the sake of <laughs> Arsenal supporters. What about the first one you scored? Uh, After 50 minutes? Yeah, I just got knocked down, and I come on the edge of the box and hit it on the volley. I didn't see it going, actually. I went through a crowd of players and... Uh, Slight deflection. Yeah, I think it caught someone's shoulder or something, didn't it? But credit to Peter Story. Did you think you were lost when uh, you were two down at half-time? Well, we felt a bit down, you know, but... Uh, we come out, you know, decided to have a go in the second half and uh, it worked out in the end. Two nothing down, most teams would have collapsed. And then we knew, absolutely knew, when the final whistle went, we went, that's it, we've won the replay. Armstrong, Radford. Yes, Kennedy! Ray Kennedy, 19 years of age. Well, Ray was like six, just over six foot. Fantastic uh, physique uh, and very left footed, but he could hold the ball up with his, with his strength, you know, uh, shrug you know, defenders off. And bring, he would used to bring other players into the game. The previous year, he scored an away goal in the European Fairs Cup final as a young lad, which gave us a chance in the second leg. And then Ray came into the team and, and forged a real great partnership with John Radford. And he was such a good team player, Ray Kennedy, but also the number of goals he scored in that double season was really good. He was a mean character, you know, he, he didn't suffer fools gladly in five sides there would be the odd punch-ups, but he was brilliant with back to goal. And it was almost when introduced suddenly alongside John Radford, it was just like you unearthed a diamond somewhere. And the two created suddenly the best partnership that you could imagine in what was then the first division. Hudson and McClintock. Charlie George again bursting in on the scene there, and McCready going with him, but he still found Radford, and now George Grail. Armstrong coming in on it. Beautifully played there by Armstrong. Oh, and a dummy there, and there's Kennedy in! Oh, a fine goal by Kennedy! Chelsea coming forward now in the fair bit of strength. But being pushed back once more. George to fasten on this one to show his speed. Radford. George. And now Kennedy claims for offside but not given. And a second goal by Ray Kennedy. Four consecutive league wins quickly became seven. The gap at the top was closing and Arsenal were in control of their own destiny. The next games would decide whether they would head to the cup final as champions. Settlitz developing into one-way traffic now, Arsenal moving forward all the time, but certainly not looking anything like in championship form. Moncler. George. He's done it!
George, perhaps having his quietest match for a long time, has done it 18 minutes from the end. I remember that well, picking the ball up about 22 yards out, and I sort of played a one-two off there, the defender, went for the return and just whacked it in the corner. Um, probably most of my friends were standing on the North Bank at the time. The excitement and the buzz you get through scoring, you know, where I used to stand as a kid, absolutely amazing. I think the game against Newcastle was a, a, quite a doer game. I think Charlie George scored a goal and he won that game 1-0. And that, yeah, it, it, it did open the door and, and, and give us that belief that, yeah, maybe, maybe we can do this. And all of a sudden Leeds lost to West Brom, my old club, up at Leeds. And there was a to-do about it. They said, oh, Tony Brown is offside and all that business. But at the end of the day, when the result came out in the newspaper, Leeds had lost to West Brom. So it'd give us a lift, didn't it? It'd give us a chance. Pass intercepted, but Saget is offside. The referee waving him on. Brown is going straight through, taking on Sprake. And the goal by Aston, and Leeds will go mad. And they've every right to go mad, because everybody stopped with the linesman flag. I guess if it had happened to us, we would have been exactly the same as Don and Jack Charlton and Norman and all the guys who protested so vehemently at the time. For us, it was, you know, it was one of those days when you suddenly think, wow, we've got two points, they've suddenly surrendered two points. That game was particularly important to us, very, very important in, in us winning it. Leeds beaten by two goals to one and their championship hopes in shatters. Arsenal had finally reached the summit of the table but the twists and turns of this title race were far from over. In a break from their chase for the double, the club's first award of the season saw them given the honorary freedom of Islington, conferred for their success, consistently high standards of sportsmanship and the pleasure they brought to the people of the borough. Chairman Dennis Hill Wood gratefully accepted the honour from the Lord Mayor. That rise forward to Storey. Story had a little difficulty from time to time this afternoon. It's Hartford now. Astle, Hartford, the return ball. Hartford! Oh, what a great little goal! What a magnificent little goal from Asa Hartford! Two minutes to half time. Arsenal get their second corner of the game. Armstrong with it. Oh, it's a good one. And hooked away for George. And it must be McClintock. Got to be McClintock. Radford spending a fair bit of time forward in a left side position. Here's John Samuels on a substitute for Pat Rice. Charlie George waiting for Story to make the run. Hartford is going to score an own goal. Hartford has scored an own goal. And he is sick, 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 sick. Bob McNabb. John Kay. Wild little touch on for Astle. And now Tony Brown. And he doesn't miss those. Tony Brown, as we've just said, so little of the game for him to see in the second half. Almost inspired by her words and drags a goal back for West Bromwich Arbor with four minutes to go. With three games of the league season remaining, Arsenal went head-to-head -head with title rivals Leeds at Ellen Road. It promised to be a classic. Well, they were fantastic games with them. Sometimes very boring because we cancelled each other out all the time. You never got an easy goal against Leeds. They never got an easy goal against us. So it was very often 0-0, 1-1, one, one, one nothing. It was that type of game, you know? We knew that they were the team to beat. You know, they were almost like the, the old Liverpool. When Liverpool dominated English football for almost two decades, Leeds were dominating the game. And let's be honest, they were the best team in the country at the time. Don Revy especially took them up from the doldrums, made it a big family club, terrific opposition, but a bit dirty as well. You know, they had physical players when they wanted to sort of like uh, sort teams out, but they also could play great football, midfield geniuses, Bremner and Giles and finishers and Alan Clark and that, you know, they, they had an outstanding team. Victory would have put the Gunners within touching distance of the title, but the controversial defeat that followed was in no way decisive. We knew we'd put ourselves in a position where as if we could, you know, even if we lost there, 
if we could win the remaining games, we could still win it on goal difference and or we could win it by one point. I don't think we deserve to lose that night. I think probably overall the, the draw was a good result, but you know, as they say in football, you do get funny results. It was a bit of a controversial goal, but apparently Jack Charlton was on side when he scored. And yeah, we protested um, that Jack was offside. And I, for the only time in my career, I actually remember losing it totally. I chased him right round the back of the goal. Uh, and he, he went that way to escape me. He should have booked me. I never got booked in my career, but I deserved to be booked that night. We were all coming back in the bus and we were all saying the referees so-and-so and so-and-so and we're calling them for everything. We're all into it, you know. We'd built up this hate of getting beaten. We were cheated out of it. And then Bob McNabb, after about half an hour, says, I think it was onside, it was Jackie Charlton's goal, and he looked 10 yards on offside. But what had happened, it was a night game, and Bob had made a tackle in the corner flag and was injured and took a while to get up, but he was out of the picture because we'd cleared the ball away, and then it was back in our 18-yard box, and we'd pushed up to catch everybody offside, not realising that Bob was still behind us. So we were absolutely convinced they cheated us, the referee was a so-and-so, and then we... <laughs> found out from Bob that he'd played Jackie Charlton on side. They were going to kill them, I'm not kidding. We wanted a real good reason, you know, to keep going. But we managed to keep going and we came back again and showed great, I know it's said a lot, but we did show great character. Another good looking little cross there by Kennedy, but so many white shirts are back there again. Kennedy again, blasting that one though straight at Charlie George. Now for Armstrong. That penalty area is so crowded. And Radford going in. And Kelly! Kelly has done it! Kelly! Not often can a penalty area have been as crowded as that. And as it bobbed about, Eddie Kelly, the substitute, put the finishing touch to it. The first division title race was reaching an unbelievable climax. Having completed their fixtures, Leeds could only watch as Arsenal had the chance to snatch the championship. To go of all places to the home of Tottenham Hotspur, I mean, that will forever be etched in my memory and all the guys and all the 35,000 fans who I think were locked outside that night. You couldn't get in Tottenham, there's that much interest in the game, it was even from 12 o'clock in the afternoon. The bus couldn't get there, you know, to White Hart Lane, we had to get out. I think we walked. The crowds outside the ground, I mean, it was frightening, it really was. We had to actually beat them, or a no-score draw. I think anything other than that, Leeds would have won it. If it had been 1-1, 2-2, 3-3, then Leeds United would have been champions. Doesn't come any better, does it, really? You know, our fiercest rivals in North London. I get a lot of stick from Yorkshire, like, you know, say, oh, your local neighbours, you know, old pally, you know, to give you the title. No way. Spurs, ain't, we wouldn't give Spurs anything, would we? I don't really remember too much about the game, you know. The, the thing was, when we went out, we knew it had to be nil-nil, or we had to win. Obviously, you go out not, not to concede, but we always fancied us chances to go one up, you know. Big Ray got the header, absolutely magnificent. Typical Ray, Ray just come in, pop, and it went in. It was quite nice for Ray in his first season to uh, score such an important goal. Once we get one goal up, I can't remember us ever even drawing a game, never mind losing a game. And, and we held on to it, and uh, that, was, that was a great night. I loved that night. I'm sure he blew that whistle early, you know, because we were a bit arguing, he was getting a bit of volley in his ear all, you know, how long they sat near the other. He certainly didn't add any time on and all that. I mean, it was an extraordinary pressure, and you were playing a club that were not only your biggest, fiercest rivals and remain so in local terms, but the only club that had achieved the double in that century. So it was, uh, it was probably the greatest night uh, for most of the players that played, the, not just that we had become champions of England, but we had done it at White Hart Lane. It was so sweet for the players and the supporters particularly to win the league at local rivals Tottenham. You know, to actually win the championship, you know, at White Hart Lane, it was a phenomenal night. Uh, we went off to the pub afterwards and celebrated. 
after winning the championship, I mean, we've been in the pub for two days, so we didn't train till Thursday afternoon, I think. To me, Liverpool were saying yesterday they thought the Arsenal side might be a bit drained out after this long battle for the league, are they? Yes, well, <laughs> Liverpool are very good at making statements of this nature. It's part of the war of nerves that they practice. Uh, it doesn't cut much ice with us. We're not drained, if anything. Uh, we're going into um, the cup final in a better frame of mind, indeed, than last Saturday, for instance. I like a bet now and again, and I couldn't believe it that they made Liverpool favourites to win the cup on that day. I mean, there was no way we were going to get beat on Saturday after winning the uh, uh, league on Monday. We've now got a chance of, you know, of, of emulating what Spurs had done in 60-61 and become only the second side in that century to win the double. It's ten years now since Spurs did the double. If you do it on Saturday afternoon, would that be a more considerable footballing achievement, do you think? Yes, I think so. I think the game is now much more difficult uh, than it was. It's becoming more and more difficult to, to earn and win points. And I think any club uh, at the present time and uh, in the years to come who can do the double with all the pressures and extra games that we have to contend with, I think have proved themselves probably better than their counterparts 10 and 30 years ago. Like all classic cup finals of the era, the television cameras captured the opinions of just about everyone with an interest in the game, even the players' children. Why do you think Arsenal will win it, Christopher? Because they're, because they're the best team in the whole world. What about Liverpool, though? They won't. They will lose. Do you think Arsenal are going to win the cup? Yes. Why do you think that? I don't know. And these are two of the McClintock boys. You are? Neil. And how old are you, Neil? Uh, seven and three quarters. And that's? Ian. Ian, how old is Ian? Six. Six. Do you play football? Yes. Ian, tell me about your football. Where do you play? Uh, centre forward, mostly. Do you think Arsenal are going to win the cup? Yeah. I felt as though we were a better team in Liverpool that year, but they had the great Bill Shankly behind them. So, and you had Bob Paisley sitting in his dugout with them. You know, great guys of football. Um, and we just felt as though we were a better team. I thought we were a better team. I always felt personally that we would beat Liverpool. And if you had anyone that actually see or was at the game, we should have ended up about 4-1, really, full time. George Graham, a nice little touch off there for Charlie George. And he let that one go! He really does strike those balls beautifully. Radford. Armstrong's made a run towards the far side. Armstrong! My goodness, that was close! Armstrong completely undetected. Smith standing over the ball. Also close at hand, we have Callaghan. And there's Callaghan playing it off for Lindsay, left-footed. Oh, I say it now, can Lawler turn it back? Good way, good work by Wilson. McNabb, and now Radford. Ball trying to lift that over Smith's head, he lifts it forward for Kennedy! Oh, what a miss! some fine work there as uh, Kennedy applauding his fellow striker Radford. It could have been 4-0, 5-0. I mean, they had one cleared off the line, I think. We had one cleared off the line. But after that, we made, like, three, four real clear-cut chances. But it's Radford to take it, to summon up an effort for a long one. George Graham will try and flick it on. My goodness, he almost got it there and flicked away, finally. Skipper doing a skipper's job to number four, Tommy Smith. And now the corner. Oh, and almost, and almost there again by Graham. And Liverpool in terrible trouble until Larry Lloyd finally gets it away from Graham's header. Simpson's free kick forward. Radford trying to make something of it. And Kennedy, he's all right, he's onside. Oh, just past that post. McNabb in there. And Rice, and there goes the whistle for the end of 90 minutes. And now the players will rest themselves for a couple of minutes, get fresh instructions. You don't really need Gene up. You, you just encourage each other, you know, and little reminders and watch him because he can do this, he can do that, and all that sort of stuff. I was absolutely shattered afterwards. I mean that. I was 
completely gone. I'd given so much that year, and every game was another game. I played the pre-season games, the cup games, the league games, a whole lot. And I, I don't know, it was about 85 or 86 games I'd played that year. So I was out of it at the end of the game. I'd had such an amazing season. I, you know, I was already Arsenal's player of the season from the fans. And so for me, it was like a, a, a catastrophe that we got to 90 minutes still at nil-nil when we should have, we hit the post twice and Geordie Armstrong missed a couple. And we went into extra time and then there am I with Steve Highway bearing in on me. Bob made his one Lulu in the game, and he? he came off his line a little bit, left a gap, and he, he found it. Still Highway, dangerous indeed! Oh, a goal! Oh, that's the goal! Steve Highway for Liverpool! Wilson came away from that near post, and Highway found the gap. I'd always tried to help the defence, so I was edging, thinking he's going to cross this, and he pinged it low, and just remember spinning on my heels and it clipping the bottom of the post and going in. And as I as I looked up, I mean, I could hear the Liverpool fans roaring. You know, it it, it, it was an instance. God, I'm going to cost us the double. I'm going to I'm going to we're going to lose one nothing. Bob Wilson had come too far off his post there, and it was in on the near post. Really, a goalkeeper shouldn't be beaten like that. Bob. <laughs> Bob still takes some some stick over that, you know. But he was anticipating a cross and he was beating at the near post. But I mean, when it ends up when you win and all that, all these things are forgotten. It's sad that I have to go to my grave being reminded about Steve Highway's goal. But anyway, within a few moments, we got a really fluky goal. George and Kennedy again. Bradford. Back over his head, Kelly is right in there, playing much more as a striker in this extra time. And it's there! George Graham! It's George Graham who got the touch and makes it 1-1! George will always say he touched it. Close call, I think. Listen, I thought it brushed my knee. Uh, apparently the television says no, and that was fine. I mean, that, again, that was the most important thing. That on one way, you're Eddie, or on the other. No, it came to me, and that's why everybody thought it was, you know, me that got the goal. But see, no, it was credited with Eddie. Eddie Kelly is credited, but he, George certainly put off Ray Clements and the defenders. Graham claimed it. But the more I keep looking at the video of the uh, game, he's got a guilty look on his face. So the goal went to Eddie. Graham, Radford, Charlie George. Oh, Charlie George, who can hit him? Oh, a great goal! Charlie George! Oh, what a fabulous goal by George! Clemens had no chance with that. And that puts Arsenal into the lead. I think it was a goal kick. I mean, it went to George. George, Graham knocked it back to me. I knocked it back to him. Well, I, none of us wanted it, you know what I mean? And then it went to Charlie. He gave me it back. And I just rolled it in his path. Braddy didn't want to shoot when we got down the other end, he didn't have enough energy, and uh, I was the only one that could shoot that hard. Probably only Charlie had the energy. The power of his shot was unbelievable. But we were, we were all knackered. We were all absolutely knackered at the end of the game. But Charlie's, you know, at the end of the game, he had this power, this great shooting ability, you know, and uh, that gave us a double. You know, the boy who'd stood on the North Bank, the local boy made good the local boy that I had taught as a teacher, you know? I mean, Charlie was one of my students at Holloway School, and there he was, not only winning the FA Cup for us, but then very memorably lying on his back, and, you know, whether he was knackered or whether he was doing it for effect, the plain fact is it got us over the line. I was so tired, I was laying on the floor, but didn't I kill some time? I must have laid on the floor for half hour. Must have took the whole of extra time up. People said to him, what, you, what were you saying to him? <laughs> Get up, you lazy sod, lad. It's 30 minutes to go yet. And it's all over. And Arsenal have won, and they've done the double. Frank McClintock, his losing streak at Wembley is over. Four times here a loser, and now a brave and brilliant winner. Liverpool players lying exhausted on the turf, shattered after going up and then falling behind. So Arsenal, what a week. On Monday, they clinch the league championship and five days later, they complete the double.
we just believed in, in each other so much. There was a tremendous, tremendous camaraderie. And we just thought that we could beat anybody and everybody. We emulated Tottenham's feet of 61 and became only the second club in that century to win the double. And now Frank McClintock. Bob Wilson put his arms around him. And what a cheer for McClintock as he goes up to get the FA Cup. be savouring every step, every embrace, and every moment. What a week. League Championship, back in the Scottish party, Footballer of the Year, and in a moment to hold the FA Cup aloft as well. What a smile. From His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, the cup goes to Frank McClintock and the Arsenal. Dr. Stephen, the chairman of the FA. Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Kent. And there it is for that wonderful crowd of Arsenal. There can't be a moment to touch it. Bob Wilson our friend Bob McNabb, scorer of that brilliant winning goal, who wins a golden boot worth a thousand pounds, Charlie George, John Radford, George Armstrong, Ray Kennedy at only 19, Eddie Kelly, that brilliant substitute, George Graham, who got the first goal that put Arsenal back in it, Peter Story injured who went off, Peter Simpson and Pat Rice. Bertie Me there with the cup and Frank McClintock and Don Howe. Things like that never sink in for a couple of days. You've done it and you're, you're celebrating and you don't know really what you've done. It's only afterwards that you really think that was wonderful. For me, it was my big ambition. It was bigger than the league for me personally because as a kid, I'd always dreamed about winning the FA Cup. To me, once the game was over, all you wanted to do, you, oh, let's have a few beers, you know, it's the old culture of the 60s and the 70s was, let's get the, the game's over, we've done what we had to do, let's have a few beers and a laugh now. Later on, I realised how chuffed I was and how lucky I was to, to have won the double, but I never get the feeling I should have done because of just sheer tiredness. Frank was a winner, you know, he'd been to so many cup finals and got beat, and to win the double was amazing. And, what happened to a greater captain. The I've been at the Arsenal for ten and a half years from a boy, and it's the same, once an Arsenal player, always an Arsenal player. We were all very proud to be Arsenal players. I look back on the double year with great enjoyment and great pride. I just think it was a fantastic achievement. It was a pity, really, that the team didn't go on and, and achieve more. People have never said we were a great footballing side. They've never accepted that our 70-71 side, and even I have had to say, even though we scored great goals, we weren't loved like the Arsene Wenger side of 2002. But if you're talking about great teams, if you're talking about the perfect jigsaw of rough edges and smooth edges, we were absolutely the perfect jigsaw.